Good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending tonight. I'll uh, call the meeting to order. It's with great respect and humility we acknowledge and honor the lands of the Sinaimuk people. The Sinaimuk people maintain their profound, unique, and spiritual connection to the land through ageless traditions, teachings, and stewardship and expressions of reciprocity. I have one special announcement to make this evening in that there's been a special business committee scheduled for next Wednesday at 6 p.m. That's Wednesday, February the 17th. And the one item on the agenda will be the first draft of the long range facilities plan. Uh, moving on, are there any additions, deletions or changes in order to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Trustee Stanley and seconded by Trustee O'Neill. Thank you. Are there any op, uh, anybody opposed to adoption of the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Moving on to item number six, approval of the business committee meeting minutes held on January the 13th, 2021. Uh, the motion reads that the minutes of the business committee meeting held on January 13th, 2021 be approved. Would someone like to move the motion? Moved by Trustee McKay and seconded by Trustee Barron. Is anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, motion carries. Moving on to item seven, uh, there are no presentations in this section of our agenda this evening. Item eight on to senior staff reports. Uh, 8.1, we have uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh with an information sheet on student enrollment projections, and that's on page seven of your agenda. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good evening, uh, trustees and our partners uh, and members of the viewing public. So this evening, the first item that we're here to present, and uh, before I start, I just want to recognize the incredible work of Ms. Sutton, who is present with us this evening, and her team uh, in working through the enrollment projections that you see this evening. And what the enrollment projections are, they're for uh, two purposes. One is there to, so we can create our 21-22 preliminary budget, uh, which the process is, this is the first step in that process uh, to, to figure out what our financial outlook looks like based off of our enrollment. The second thing is, is so that we can start preparing uh, to understand what staffing looks like, understanding if we need any additional space, portable moves, etc. Uh, at our schools based off of these preliminary numbers. So a couple of things go into these numbers uh, just to bring everyone's attention to. And so one of them is, uh, as the board is aware, we use a, a projection or enrollment projection company called Barragar Systems, and that's common throughout the system, the uh, public education system in British Columbia. And so what they do is they take uh, kind of longer term and short term trends uh, to try to along with some density and along with some birth rates in the neighborhoods to make a determination of what our student populations in our schools are going to look like. I will say um, this year is a particularly challenging year. And so I do want to take the opportunity um, and in the, the information sheet, it walks through those what those challenges are. And I think COVID is the most significant challenge uh, to take into account. And districts across the province are facing the same kind of concerns is how do we take into account what COVID, the, what COVID did for the current year and how COVID may influence next year and how we ensure that we have the flexibility to, to move if we need. So what we've done based off the Beauregard numbers is we have made some assumptions about uh, the system going back to I wouldn't describe it as normal, but I would describe as more traditional in the sense that of a far larger return to bricks and mortar. Uh, and then and then Ms. Sutton and her team determined the kids that went to ICE, uh, kind of repopulated to a certain extent their schools. Uh, and then what we've done is we have an, we've used a conservative brush 
to determine what the enrollment projections would be. So if Ms. Matthews, if I could ask you to bring up page nine of the agenda. And so you'll see uh, on the budget 2021, we were budgeting for 13,898 and we came in significantly below that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the enrollment decline, or I'm sorry, we we're minus 155 uh, overall. So what we are projecting is an increase in enrollment uh, next year, but it's relatively modest and then really back to normal and more so in 2022-23. Again, our projections uh, that the trustees that, that everyone is seeing right now are relatively conservative. And so everything being equal and and you know COVID vaccines are, are out and people are feeling really comfortable about schools again, that number is going to be higher than you see. But the issue of course is that if we miss and we make our budget and we staff our schools on a number that's more than than our budget, it's very difficult to back that out. It's easy to respond to additional staff or additional FTE, very difficult to react to, to less. And this year is the perfect example. If we didn't have the federal funding, for instance, we'd be in a significant uh, deficit or we would have had to rejig our entire elementary school population at the beginning of September. So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, the rest of the enrollment with respect to special needs and you know continuing ed, uh, distributed, alternative, et cetera, are based uh, on, again, those projections, trying to take in uh, what we think is reasonable in the circumstances based on our previous experience. And we've also reached out to uh, our various principals and administrators in schools and who are running the various programs uh, for their input. Uh, again, we're probably being a little bit more careful than than they would be because, of course, our projections do in, uh, uh, adjust their staffing. So if you could turn to page 10, Ms. Matthews, and just you scroll down just a little bit for just a little bit further, please. And a little bit further just to the magic number of the ball. Yeah, so if if our projections were bang on and leave out all the other cost pressures that the district might have from year to year due to inflation, due to salary increases, et cetera. Uh, if we were to get the increase, our budget, our operating budget that is, would see an increase uh, of $731,000. And so what you're seeing, the, the work product that flows from these projections is going to be the preliminary budget. And that's what we wanted to bring the board uh, for information this evening and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, are there any trustees or stakeholders who have a question? I see we do have a question from uh, Trustee Stanley. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Yes, hi, um, Secretary Treasurer Walsh and, and, and team. I can't say that I envy you in trying to make predictions in this context because it is entirely unpredictable. So my question is questioning those predictions, but with a massive grain of salt, I guess, or respect for the challenges. I'm just not convinced that we're going to get such a dramatic return to bricks and mortar um, based on um, vaccine delays so far. I, I know you don't have answers to this, um, I think, but I guess what I'm wanting to know is to what extent, A, are we flexible as we see the vaccines roll out or not roll out as predicted? And um, do we have any way of receiving like estimating you know say we come in april and it's it appears to be delayed but you know how can we be flexible in responding to the situation given that september has been so far the deadline that we've been told that you know vaccines will have largely rolled out yet we're having to plan well in advance of that sure isn't through you, Madam Chair, or, I'm sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question. So uh, there's a couple of things that we do have. So of course, if, if April rolls around, or even as this budget process rolls around and it becomes increasingly apparent that um, 
we're not going to meet those numbers. What we can do is we can readjust <clears throat> kind of for our own internal purposes, our enrollment projections, and then we would what that would end result in is less staffing going to schools. So this year, of course, what's happened is there is dozens of classes in our elementary schools right now that would not in a normal year be there based off of class size numbers. So what we had the luxury of doing this year, number one, to not have to adjust cohorts, but number two, frankly, to support kids and to have less density in schools, we have much smaller class sizes in our elementaries. That would be something, that would be the first area that we would look is to try to not throw that staffing out. And if we all of a sudden got to June or July, uh, then, and, and you know, something happens that, that kids are starting to leave again, then we need to look th through what our collective agreement obligations are, probably approach the NDTA again to say, look, there's going to be staff that are impacted and we want to do it in the most respectful way that we possibly can. How do we come up with a way that likely flows staff from bricks and mortar to to ICE without having to, you know, issue layoff, et cetera. But w the conservative enrollment, along with making sure that our eyes are on the our eyes are on the the, the kids that are actually going to be in the seats as we go through the budget process, it, I think is going to solve a lot of that. Not all of that, though. So if we lose, you know, a, a thousand kids, it, there needs to be layoffs uh, at, at some point. And given what we're seeing and, and hearing with respect to what uh, the kind of provincial take on the expectations for September and the medical professionals are telling us, um, we don't want to be overly pessimistic and impact a whole bunch of school cultures by removing, we don't want to remove teachers if we don't absolutely have to. Thank you. I don't I don't envy you in this task, so I appreciate this. The, the one other thing I may point out is that we don't have these numbers yet, but we certainly anticipate uh, coming to the board at some point with what we think the end of the year surplus would be if indeed there's going to be one and likely there will and what that could mean for how we support kids next year as well and that might be able to provide a bit of a cushion. We're not relying on that for the budgetary process to be clear, uh, but we also don't want to be unrealistic and you know cry that we're you know we're poor when maybe we're not. Thank you Mr. Walsh. Uh, Trustee Stanley, do you have a follow-up to your question? Thank you. Um, so moving on, the next on our speakers list is Mr. Sphere. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Walsh. Um, just looking at the the, the amount that is uh, sort of on there, um, you know, and, and looking at the, con even if it's conservative based on the fact that we know there's, there's wages increases and stuff coming in, we are already looking at a deficit based on what numbers you put out there. So that sort of puts me out of a bit of, did you use today's formula for funding without uh, taking con consideration that those things would be um, covered by the government? So th through you, Mr. Chair, and perhaps um, Ms. Sutton wants to add to this, but no, I, at this point, this is not, this is just saying, here's what revenue based off of currently what exists. Those numbers will change in March when we get the the new funding. So every March we we hear from the ministry, they adjust their their funding amounts based off of a variety of factors, including uh, typically they'll either roll it into the block or give it as a special grant to cover collective agreement increases, for instance. This revenue number is not including that. Ms. Sutton, maybe you'd like to add to that? Uh, sure. This, yes, to confirm, this was put together sort of in a worst case scenario without any uh, increase anticipated by ministry, but we are certain that we see that that per pupil increase generally each year. We just don't know what that is, so don't want to account prematurely for it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh and um, Ms. Sutton. Do you have a follow up, Mr. Fair? Nope, thanks. That answered my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to Trustee Berzovic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Walsh, you may have kind of just hit on the answer to my question when you said March. 
So we haven't, have we re received any feedback from the ministry about what they're thinking for their, for the fall in terms of their projections around what stage we might be in or? So through you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Saywell, Superintendent Saywell may want to add to this, but um, I mean, well, from what I've heard, the expectation is, is that we would be looking at stage one, um, mm -hmm. but I, it is pretty early, but perhaps okay. Mr. Superintendent Saywell has something to add, no? <laughs> well, at, at the risk of just repeating uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, we're hearing from the Ministry of Education that will be in uh, stage one come September. Okay. They're optimistic that the vaccines will roll out through the summer and we'll be ready to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh and Mr. Saywell. Uh, do you have a follow up, Trustee Berzovic? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And my apologies, Miss C. I do not want to mispronounce your name. Perhaps you can help me with that, but you are next on our speakers list. Certainly, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's coin weight. Um, so my question for you, uh, Mr. Chair, to um, the Secretary Treasurer Walsh is, um, if we are looking at layoffs of teaching staff, when would we be looking at those layoffs? So through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think um, Ms. Trick or Ms. Dolan is here. So I'm going to have to get back. I'll have to respond to you and I'll copy the board uh, or maybe respond to the next meeting as a question that was asked just to, to confirm that. Thank you very much. That's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cornthwaite. Oh, I got that wrong and my apologies. I will work on this. Um, so thank you, Mr. Walsh. I appreciate the information sheet and your response. So we'll move on seeing that there, oh, uh, my apologies. I see there is one more question uh, that just popped up in the chat window from Trustee Barron. Thank you, Chair. I just slid right in there. Thank you for catching it uh, through the chair to our secretary treasurer. I just wanted to clarify um, on page 13 uh, with the surplus amount, it says in there about um, more specifics being provided in the third quarter. And then you'd also said, I guess, could you speak a little bit further to, um, you know, if we have a better idea of a deficit or a surplus at the time of the third quarter, will there be enough time for us to be able to make adjustments and, and what does that look like? Just trying to understand a little bit more. Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. So I'm not quite on the annual budget on that's on page 13. On that section. Yeah, okay. perhaps I could hold that question just for a moment and because I do have a little bit of an update on, on how we can spend some money this year, for instance, coming up in just a that. moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so seeing there are no further questions related to uh, this item, we'll move on to item number 8.2. Secretary Treasurer Walsh with an information sheet on the amended annual budget and I'll pass it over to Mr. Walsh. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Sutton, could you come on just because I want to make sure everyone realizes that uh, we're talking about the great work that you've done in preparing this as well. So. Um, so thank you. So tonight we're talking about our Q2 as well as our amended annual budget. And so the outcome of this particular, this is an action sheet, and the outcome that staff will be seeking is a recommendation to the board to do two things. One, uh, agree to three readings at the board meeting. Uh, and so that will need to be unanimous uh, at the board meeting. And then two, uh, that you support the annual uh, annual amended budget. In the event that you don't support the annual amended budget, if you pa if you vote in affirmative to the three readings, you can still vote against the annual budget. That that motion does not need to be uh, unanimous this evening, though. To be clear, so what we're looking at this this evening is essentially so. Last spring, we created a budget based off of our best estimates of enrollment, of, of where we'd be in various schools. So essentially the document that we just looked at with, with respect to enrollment led to our preliminary budget 
and then of course changes happen and then this year is the most and I know we use it all the time, but it's an unprecedented budget year in the sense that the changes have been absolutely enormous. And, and so what the annual budget is doing is reflecting actually where we're at from the increased revenues, the losses that we've seen, the changes in where the kids are going to school, et cetera, um, have gone. And I'm going to touch on a few highlights and we're both happy to answer very specific questions about it. So the information sheet highlights some things we've talked about a, a number of times. Uh, and I think the overarching a theme to this year has been the moves from our bricks and mortar schools to our uh, our distributed learning. So I'm going to start on page 12 of the presentation and Ms. Matthews, if you could bring that up. And as I get started, uh, one of the things that I think is really important for everyone to keep in the back of their mind as we're looking at these myriad of numbers is remember that we are having two different pots of money that we're looking at. In fact, there's three, including capital, but we don't need to worry about capital for this particular um, submission. But really, we have an operating budget and we have a special purpose funds pot. And that is incredibly important because there's th there's the special purpose funds that you're going to see, including the federal funds to support COVID, as well as the CEF. And so that's not necessarily going to be reflected when we're talking about our operating fund. So on page 12, what we see is the impact of our massive decline in bricks and mortar um, FTE and then our massive increase in our DL uh, programming and also our, our increase in homeschooling as well. So when all the when all the ins and outs are, are added up at the end of the day, we were down one point four million dollars from our anticipated uh, revenue in, in that front. So when we go back to Trustee Stanley's question, and what would happen if we based our budget off the enrollment projections that we have in the previous presentation and all of a sudden kids continued to go to DL, this is what would happen. And so this is what we, we have our, our eyes uh, very, very uh, focused on. If you could turn to page 13, Ms. Matthews. So here is our Q two uh, so here again is if you'll recall uh, on a regular basis we come to the board and we talk about where where we at, are at with respect to, to spending and revenue uh, and I like to focus on expenses so it's the second it's in the middle of, of that particular page and when you think about a school system a school system is a 12 as everybody has a 12 month fiscal but we often we really have a 10 month system. And so many of the expenses that we should be having for 10 month employees or for teachers that get paid over 10 and not 12 months, you should start to see these numbers, uh, you know, around, you know, 50 percent if we're half if we're five months in. Etc. Uh, and then we always like to provide the comparator to show where we're at uh, compared to a previous uh, year. Uh, it's 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 not the best metric because obviously our budget changes from year to year, uh, but you'll see that there's nothing that's jumping out as a significant uh, uh, change and where there are discrepancies they're often related to the timing of this report. So for instance, if uh, a single payroll in 2019-20 was done prior to this report, but not done prior to the 2020-21 report, we're going to have two full weeks of pay that's not reflected, which could equal actually a significant percentage. So we don't see any discrepancies that we're concerned about. Um, one of the things I would note, I'll uh, point out the substitute numbers there, and you'll see uh, we're projected or we're, we're sitting at 41% of our projected uh, substitute uh, use. Last year was 43% at this time. We, 
that's that's good and it's bad news. So it's bad news in the sense that we probably had some failure to fills for EAs, not so many teachers this year, but um, so with rising number of staff, you know, if we haven't filled an EA, then that would actually end up being a savings. But the other big thing here is it really bears out the reality that Ms. Trick has been reporting about how really normal and sometimes even lesser absenteeism has been. Flus, colds, etc. I guess are down. Now this may well change uh, and we are a little concerned about this now that um, BCPC has uh, indicated they're going to change the way that individuals that have been required to quarantine are paid. Uh, so that could raise the, these numbers a little bit. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in, in Q3. Now, with respect to uh, Trustee Barron's question about surplus, and so the note, if, if Ms. Matthews, can you scroll to the bottom of this page? Uh, just and to the note at the bottom. So you're seeing here that it's talking about a budgetary, a budgetary surplus. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're sitting in an additional 6.7 you know, million. There's still staffing um, that, that has to, to, to be accounted for. Um, and Ms. Sutton, maybe I could ask you to add to, to that note just a little bit if possible. Uh, just that at this point we've received 51% uh, worth of the revenue and we've had 47% overall worth of expenditures. So, you know, at the end of the year, we will have 100 and 100 and, uh, and those numbers, I mean, we could very well have a surplus, but that's not what this number is reflecting right now. It's a, it's a point in time differential between the revenue and expense. Yeah, and so to, to add, to, to answer Trustee Barron's question, so by the end of Q3, we're going to have a very good sense of uh, where, if there is a surplus, where that surplus would be. And so, for instance, um, we've maintained travel budgets in a number of budgets. We know that money's not going out. We know that there might be a release time that we have in budgets that just simply is not able to be used. Uh, the fact that we have hired so many additional teachers has put pressure on our TTOC list to the point where we're still filling um, very, very well, but we might not have the bodies to be able to actually have that extra workshop or, or do some of those things as well. So there, there are some surplus funds there. Um, you know, Pro, Pro D is still happening, but it's not travel, et cetera. So those are those are some of the items that we'll that we'll have a sense of. The other one that's a wild card is is I think I reported a month ago or so, or maybe even the month before that, that we were in a really awkward position in the fact that since we had not received the federal funding up until literally last Wednesday or Thursday even, we couldn't put it in our budget, which meant that we were actually way, way over budget because we had expended teaching staff for the most part, but as well as custodial, clerical support, et cetera far in excess of the money that we had in the bank, knowing or at least anticipating that the federal funds uh, were, were coming. Now that they've come, we've been able to offset those expenses, and now we're looking to see if we have the ability to you know, provide more money. So an example is, is that the board approved um, some conting contingency dollars for staffing um, as part of this budget process. I believe in September it was approved. And because, because of our limitation on being able to use the federal funds fully because they weren't actually in, in the house, those contingencies were being held until the, the federal funds have come. Now they've come, Learning Services is able now to go have more staffing specifically focused on learning loss and reach out to students. And so thanks to last Thursday's um, final you know, outcome with respect to that, we're now able to go spend th this money that's available to us. But again, we only have, what, five months left. Uh, we've got to staff them, we've got to fill the positions. Uh, so, so there may be a little bit of money left in, in that area as well. So that's where the, that's where YQ2 is really difficult to predict. The one last one that I would uh, point out is we know that the Ministry of Education has a holdback from all of the school districts like ours 
that lost enrollment uh, or at least enrollment moved to to online and therefore we get less funding. So what that number looks like when it's divvied back to districts could well impact us. But if all of a sudden that doesn't happen until the end of March, we may be looking around and talking as a district to say, well, is expending all of that money for two and a half months, the is that going to be effective or can we think about what that could look like for next year, et cetera? So that's why that has to wait to Q3. So sorry for the very long answer to a very short question. And maybe I can pause, I see a question there. Yes, thank you, Mr. Walsh, for that uh, very detailed and good overview of uh, where we're at today. So thank you. And we do have a uh, Mr. Zvir who would like to uh, to speak. Uh, uh, thank you, through the chair, to Mr. Uh, to Secretary Walsh. Um, I know I had this conversation a little bit earlier with you, but my my part is, is based on last year's, and and you can see the projected uh, usage. And we're following the somewhat of the same trend. And I know you said there may be some additional stuff come in and, and possible additional funding. But the last year's surplus was a little bit bigger than anticipated. And, and my number crunching says we're going to hit about the same mark. Um, and I know you're conservative and uh, I would rather say in COVID if we can save something and, and try to make whatever because we don't know what March brings. But I am saying it on notice that I do believe and I, I mean I haven't been too far off that I think we're going to run a surplus the same and if not higher than last year and uh, you know we say we spent surplus to maintain this balance but I've taken those numbers out and if we took those out just as the norm we would still be able to maintain the balance that we are and keeping that money in in intact so um, just my question is, is how you know, when you look at that trend from year to year, how do we not get better at trending out over the future? Sure, Th through you, Mr. Chair. So again, this this year, it's a bit of a all bets are off with respect to what that, that trend line looks like. Um, and I will say again that if the federal funds had not come in, we would be in some straits. So um i guess i guess that's a little bit of this that is added a, a context to this year that can't really make comparables to last what we what we do do and and some of the discussion that we've been having particularly among departments though is exactly exactly that in the sense that well if you have a pot of money that's surplused on a year-to-year -year basis do you actually need that budget or do we just reallocate and put that budget somewhere else? So there, there's one of the, we are actually having those conversations internally. So for instance, um, you know, Mr. S Mr. Sabo is doing a heck of a job in one area in energy, for instance, but is having challenges keeping up his supplies. Well, when is it time to reallocate those funds from energy to supplies so we actually don't run a purposeful surplus when we know we might have a deficit in one area. So uh, that's one thing that we're doing. I don't know, Ms. Sutton, do you want to add, add to that? I think at the end of the day, we have a, a budget and that is our financial plan and we do our best to adhere to that plan and, and staff and spend accordingly. But, you know, things get in our way, COVID, um, finding employees uh, that, are, that are what we need um, at a given time. Uh, sometimes we aren't able to fill positions and so forth. And so, uh, you know, many contributing factors um, derail our plans at times and, and make so we've got a bigger surplus than anticipated. But we do our best to to follow that plan and, and hope to not come in with a large surplus. But again, a little surplus is uh, is healthy for the district for future planning as well. And for, you know, that COVID related who knew rainy day. Thank you, Mr. Walsh and Ms. Sutton. Um, did you have a follow-up, Mr. Zver? No, uh, thank you, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, Trustee Barron, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sutton and uh, Secretary-Treasurer Walsh for answering my, my overly excited question that I asked 
before uh, in this section. You did answer my question, so I appreciate that. And I hope I'm not jumping the gun again, but I want to make sure I don't miss it. There was, it's just a small question, and I'm not sure um, who would be the, the best person to ask, but in um, page on page 16 now, I can wait if you're getting there, but on page 16 around the summary of changes, there's just a role in there that I, if it was told to me before, I don't remember, but I was wondering if somebody could clarify the special needs community youth worker position that's in that section. So the summary of change, page 16. I've just never heard of that. If I have, I'm forgetting it. And Uh, can I suggest that perhaps Mr. Walsh can uh, find the answer and send it out um, rather than put them on the spot right now? Sure. Yeah, that works too. Thanks. Thank you, uh, yeah. Trustee Barron. We'll get we'll get that. I'm sure quickly here. So, <clears throat> so uh, Mr. Oh. Walsh, did you have more to present before we? Um, ask the board to consider the motions yeah i just uh, mr chair if i could just um just a few, couple small things additionally miss miss matthews could you turn to page 14. And again, the changes in revenue and expenses are often really good uh, learning uh, learning tools generally to to illustrate how the ebbs and the flows of our of our budgeting process and our kind of year yearly budgeting process works. So, for instance, almost you know quite soon after the preliminary budget was passed last year, all of a sudden um, we became you know we were made aware of the labor settlement funding, so the three point six million dollars. And then obviously it goes to pay exactly for $3.6 million worth of expense. And so here's the good, interesting kind of framework to understand how things can change throughout the year. So collect or reduction in anticipated rentals and leases. You'll recall that we came to the board, I believe in September or October and said, we actually now know because of COVID that we're not going to meet our our mark with respect to revenues and on rentals and leases. And so we need to drop the budget and the board knows, and then here's where it's represented in that final amended budget. And then if ironically, if you then scroll or look down to the bottom of the changes in revenue, rental revenue is increased by $100,000. And that's because we, at the time when we said, well, we're gonna have less rental revenue, we couldn't anticipate there'd be a provincial election that was going to bring us more rental revenue. So this shows the kind of ebb and the flow of of what what we what we kind of don't know in in April and May when we're doing this, which is why it's preliminary in nature. So then what I'll Miss Matthews, if I could get you to turn to page 17. And I just there's there's if you go down to expenses just scroll down just a little bit further i just want the board um, well everyone to be aware that there is a minor discrepancy under expenses so the instructional total and this is going to be uh, amended uh, for when the board actually votes on it to be clear the total expense amount is correct the 180 million dollar number is correct but in the instruction number is incorrect. The instruction number is slightly over 144 million. The district admin number is uh, about six and a half million. And so those numbers, it's just, just a minor error there that will be corrected uh, for the board meeting and the board's consideration. And on page 21, and, you, and Ms. Matthews, you don't need to turn there, and page 30, um, there's similar typographical uh, differences that will be changed to reflect that. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on on this, and I will get back to Trustee Barron's question when I get the answer to it. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Are there any other uh, questions uh, for Mr. Walsh before we move on? 
uh, Trusty Baron, or sorry, Trusty Stanley. Hi. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so before I ask my question, I'm going to take an opportunity to make two comments. One to the Secretary Treasurer. Uh, I have found that your summary pages that explain the nature of the changes to be so incredibly helpful that you've answered almost all of my questions before we came to this meeting. So, and you know me by now, that actually speaks volumes. So I uh, thank you very much. That was uh, an excellent communication tool. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge, and I don't know if I did this when we discussed the budget before, but I maybe I just noticed it this time, but I just feel like we need to say kudos to the Cordoy pack. Um, because when you look at this budget, they are aligned um, for their um, fundraising for the playground of $85,000. And, um, you know, what an incredible amount of work for parents to do. Uh, I know that many of the PAC members who have raised this money, their children won't even benefit from this because by the time the playground's built, their, their kids will be out of the school. So I just want to acknowledge um, that. And I'm sorry I didn't do that in the previous budget, but it was here and I was reminded. So thank you. Kudos, Cordway Pack. I do have a question that's relevant. Um, and I believe it's on page um, 15 and it's about the special purpose um, fund and the expenses and the nature of the changes. So in the, you know, there's a significant um, change in the uh, increase in the expenses uh, in the amended budget compared to the um, annual budget. And I think I think I understand the salaries piece because I think you explained that in your changes. But I'm wondering when we, um, sorry, yeah, no, sorry, special purposes. I've got an operating fund question too, but I'm wondering if you could just briefly tell us like what is the contributing factor that led to those increases that we're now acknowledging in the amended budget for the special purpose fund. Thank thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Well, two two major ones and they are they are outlined on page 16. Uh, the clearly the federal funding uh, is the dominant uh, feature in this particular the leading to that those. So using those federal funds to support uh, our increase in distance learning uh, and custodial, et cetera. So that that's the 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 biggest chunk. The second one is, um, and if you look on page sixteen, there's a classroom enhancement fund increase of one point two million dollars. What that is is that we, again, we were able to submit our classroom enhancement fund ask to the ministry, and we were able to support every single piece of staffing that we were that that we requested. But there, as we noted, there were some small class sizes, and so we initially funded some of those that staffing out of our operating budget, and we're waiting to confirm that it would be funded from the classroom enhancement fund. And so what that did was, is when the classroom enhancement fund confirmed, they confirmed our classroom enhancement fund request, the the trans the increase in the amount we transferred money back to operating. And then we increase the amount in our special purpose funds for teaching staff in that regard. So you'll see when you add up the total additional teaching staff coming from special purpose funds, that's the largest difference in, in what we pro, we budgeted preliminarily. Number one, because we didn't know the federal fund even existed so many months before it was contemplated. And then two was just waiting for the confirmation of some CEF staffing. Ms. Sutton, I'm not sure you need to, you want to add anything to that. No, that's bang on. Just the the additional funds that we didn't have in the original budget now confirmed. All the additional staffing and expenses are the uh, overall change. Thank you, Trustee Walsh. Do you have a follow up, Trustee Stanley? Sorry, Mr. Walsh. Do you have a follow up, Trustee Stanley? I don't have a follow up, but I will put myself back on the speakers list. And I was just going to say it since I don't see one else on there right now. Uh, yes, you may go ahead. OK, thanks. Um, so forgive me, I think I've got the right page number that I'm going to reference. It's just going between screens. Normally I operate two computers. I think I'm talking about page 13. Um, 
And I'm talking about this time the operating funds. I'm just going to try to pull that up. This is same. The question is of the same nature. Um, again, looking at the significant increase and wanting to understand that specifically with regards to. I mean, I can guess. Um, but I'm trying to. Yeah, supplies and services. So uh, towards the bottom of your. Um, table there. Mm -hmm. Just trying to understand what supplies and services. I, I suspect it's COVID related, but I just wanted to ask about why we had such a dramatic increase there. Sure. So maybe I will ask Ms. Sutton if there's any specifics that she's able to reference. A lot of the uh, restricted surplus that was added to the budget that had been sitting in reserve uh, while we awaited classroom enhancement fund and while we await uh, awaited the federal funding is put into contingency accounts and those accounts uh, fall under the supplies and services category. So once those um, items are uh, transferred into staffing, they would of course be moved into one of those categories or so forth. So um, a lot of it is uh, is now that we've got those two confirmed areas, uh, we will be able to do some spending as Secretary Treasurer um, uh, spoke to earlier. Uh, as well, schools tend to sit on their budgets uh, earlier in the year trying to ensure that they've got enough to get them through. So there's some spending left at that level. Um, so it's, it's all through the system at this point. So in Q3, that number well, theoretically it would be adjusted, but we don't amend the annual budget again. So, so for instance, I, I mentioned that uh, now that the federal funding is in, uh, Learning Services is able to now really focus on things that they can do to support learning loss. Well, the moment that is someone has hired a staff, it won't be in a supplies budget anymore. It will be in the staffing budget. So those numbers will correspondingly go up and down. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Stanley and uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. I see that um, uh, Trustee O'Neill popped up on the screen. Um, did you have a question, Trustee O'Neill? Sorry, that was an accident, accidental flick of the finger. No worries. And I also see Superintendent Saywal. Would you like to say something? Oops. Thank you. Through you, Chair, to uh, Trustee Barron, who asked a question. I, um, specifically, was she asking just about the position of the special needs co community youth worker, or was she talking about the, the budget line? Uh, Trustee Barron, would you like to clarify your question for Superintendent Saywell, please? Yeah. Thank you uh, through the chair to the superintendent. In order to understand the budget line, I was trying to remember what the role was specifically. Oh. Yeah, uh, so the um, that position, what they do is they uh, they work with students of different abilities to help access supports in uh, in the community. Typically, as those students are aging out of our system and transitioning to uh, other community supports. Great, thank you very much for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Saywell, and uh, I'll pass it back to uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So subject to any further questions, um, the recommended motions are there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh. Um, would somebody like to read the first motion? Trustee Stanley, go ahead, please. Give me a minute while I pull up that screen. I believe we're talking about what's on page 20. Uh, it's on the, uh, oh, sorry, it's on page uh, two of your agenda. If you don't have it, I can read it if you oh, like. Okay. Um, no, I can pull up the agenda, that's fine. Okay, so and, page sorry. two, that the. Oh, just a moment, Trustee Stanley, I believe Mr. Walsh has something to you'd like to say. Yeah, Ms. Matthews is just reminding me that it's just one, it's one motion. Oh, OK. It'll be two, I believe, during the board meeting, but one this evening. OK, my apologies. I'm reading the agenda and it's shown as two, but if I remember correctly in the report, it was presented as one motion. 
So which one am I reading? I believe oh, it's an am, asked. so do them both. Yeah. Correct. Thank As you. one, I understand. Okay, here we go. That the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, give all three readings of the 2020-2021 amended annual budget bylaw during the February 24th, 2021 uh, 20, <laughs> open board meeting and that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, adopt the 2020-2021 amended annual budget bylaw during the February 24th, 2020, <laughs> oh my gosh, February 24th, 2021 open board meeting. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. And I see that uh, Trustee Berzovic would like to second the motion. Uh, Trustee Stanley, would you like to s motivate the motion and by saying anything? I don't think I can speak anymore. Um, no, I don't believe that it needs any motivation. We've just been given all the opportunity to ask our questions. Thank you very much. Um, so if anyone would like to speak, please let us know. Otherwise my apologies, otherwise I'll call the question. Um, okay, I'll call the question. Is there anyone that is opposed to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 8.3. This is a uh, item where we're uh, presented with a number of administrative procedures and I'll hand it back to uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so there's a number of APs uh, this evening as part of our updating process, uh, and perhaps I can go through them and answer any questions uh, individually. Really, it's two sets. One is with respect to school supplies, and one is a, a number associated with um, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy uh, APs. So with respect to uh, school supplies, uh, uh, administrators across the district have been raising concerns uh, centrally about uh, the way that the AP 305 is currently drafted and specifically the idea is is that in a number of schools uh, they will bulk order supplies based off of the various classroom needs both out of administrative well, time and convenience for parents as well as the ability to get bulk cheaper um, supplies purchased. So a class of 30 obviously is going to have uh, cheaper than an individual parent buying the same supplies. <clears throat> so the concern that's been raised recently is that the $30 limit in the AP is just not sufficient to meet that that uh, that need. And so the idea of drafting AP 305 a slightly different is to allow a little bit more flexibility with respect to that, uh, but also, of course, it's not a mandate uh, that parents must um, uh, participate in this particular bulk uh, purchase. Uh, and so the idea is, again, there's no way $30 was going to cut it, and so AP 305 really wasn't effective as an AP, uh, more prevented the process than allowed for it. And so this is just, uh, 305 is drafted in a way that would allow that flexibility uh, to, to do that. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Um, so we have a number of trustees on the speakers list. I have Trustee McKay, Trustee Stanley, Trustee Berzovic, and Trustee Barron. So we'll ask Trustee McKay to please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I have a um, two-part question. My, my question is related to the very last line in AP 305 around a separate charge may be levied for the reimbursement of school planners. I believe the intent of this is to say that it enables the schools to charge for school planners. Um, what I what my first question is before I enter into a follow up question is um, does reimbursement refer to the actual cost of the school planners? So is it a cost? Chair, my understanding that it my understanding is that it would 
uh, and I'm perhaps Mr. Davy might be available to provide a little bit more of the discussion that happened with Learning Services on this particular issue. But my understanding is reimbursement would be uh, cost recovery in the circumstances. OK, per perhaps I'll just continue rather. Um, that helps me. Thank you. Um, I guess what I'd like to see here is that. I guess my suggestion to staff would be that it looks slightly different than it currently does now. I think it, it feels slightly ambiguous and I think that the wording needs to be explicit in that it is um, a cost recovery only. And is, so whatever the cost is to buy the product for the school should be passed on to the parent. There shouldn't be differing prices between schools. Um, over the years, we've seen that practice uh, with different pricing between schools, and it has actually created inequities between schools because uh, some schools were able to have a little bit of extra money in their coffers to do purchasing, whereas others uh, did not. Um, so I guess just if the language could just be a little more explicit in that it's cost recovery only, I think that would be helpful. Um, and then just a little bit beyond that, um, is I think that it, it may also need to be identified here that whether or not these school planners are required, because if they're required, then we can't charge for them. If they're optional, I think the procedure needs to state that they're optional so that parents are clearly aware that they can buy an alternative product should they choose to. So I just think those clarifications would make it easier, recognizing the historical uh, conversations that have gone around on uh, throughout the district around school planners. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Se Secretary Treasurer Walsh, and I take it that uh, Trustee McKay does not have a follow up since she mm -hmm. turned her video off. So I'll move on to uh, Trustee Stanley. Hi, yes, I guess uh, school supplies is a hot topic. So um, my comment is to Secretary Treasurer Walsh, but I, I will say that I leave this to your discretion. I just want to provide this feedback um, as a as a parent that owns about perhaps 20 of those plastic boxes that are pencil cases and, and perhaps an equal number of rulers um, I'm wondering if there is some way that we can have in the AP that there would be some consideration with regards to our environmental stewardship um, the and you know the and and the dissuading of purchasing of unnecessary supplies. I recognize that there is an ease in ordering for every student um, based on the assumption that they need a new box every year, but let me assure you that um, I have not found uses for them and I do have concerns about the uh, waste. So to whatever extent that, that it is um, reasonable i would sure appreciate if there was a comment in our school purchasing uh, you know supply purchasing about consideration of of um environmental stewardship goals uh, with regards to purchasing of or perhaps avoiding purchasing of unnecessary supplies thank you trustee stanley i'm not sure uh if secretary walsh would like to respond to that or would you like to respond uh, through Mr. Chair, what 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 I actually think might not be a bad idea with respect to that is I understand that the environmental committee will be coming soon, <laughs> um, and I think that that one of the the goals of that committee hopefully will be to be reviewing our various policies for exactly that framework, and so um, it may be good to send there rather than me to take it away to add some wording, then give it back to the board, or maybe we put in some in interim wording to, to, to that extent. I mean, I think that the suggestions that have been made, I think are all uh, oversights by both uh, trustee, the comments made by trustee uh, McKay and trustee Stanley, so I don't see much of an issue of incorporating them, but that I generally I'm stating when we look through these policies, the statement made by Trustee Stanley probably applies to them all. And so a quick lens through the, the Environmental Committee when it's up and running is probably a good step for us to contemplate as well. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Did you uh, require a follow up, Trustee Stanley? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next uh, trustee on our speakers list, which is Trustee Brzezik. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, my question partly was answered in the sense that it was regarding the planners and whether they were optional. Uh, I guess the one thing I would say, not only in terms of the planners, but in terms of supplies, because the dollar amount has been removed, that it, I think it's important that we state that that we are only going to be charging cost recovery and that we're not trying to make a profit off off anything here. That this is you know that we're you know, we're just trying to make it easier for people and make it easier for everybody by doing this in bulk, but that uh, it won't be more expensive for people than going and doing, shouldn't be more expensive for people than going and doing, doing it themselves. And I guess I, do, I would wonder, has was DPAC consulted at all in, in terms of any ideas, in terms of the, the changes in this policy? Through you, Mr. Chair. So in this case, no, and this is one of those. AP, um, sorry. Oh. sorry, I called it a policy. I meant to say AP. AP, yeah, yeah. So, so no, but again, this is one of the ones where we may be sending it out for further comment in any event. What we what we're already getting questions because we got questions last year and it was too late to change gears as planning for next year. And so we thought we would bring those changes forward. So we'll make sure to bring this. Um, well, I can. I can see Miss Lee is there, <laughs> but we'll make sure to bring this to our next meeting with um, with DPAC as well for comments. And I assume we'll end up coming back with a few more changes uh, to the board so they can review. Um, but we are hoping again to be able to proceed with the idea that we're planning um, to be a little bit more flexible with respect to the number next year. Thank you. No follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Mr. Walsh. So the next uh, on our list is Trustee Barron. Thank you. Through the chair, my question was not asked, so I'm going to ask it. I just wanted to uh, first thank our Secretary Treasurer for, you know, I'm very uh, impressed by the consistency and uh, the quantity of APs that you've been bringing forward to our meetings. It's very exciting to see those getting chipped away at and getting updated and uh, and edit it as needed so that that's been great to see some cleanup being done around that they can get outdated quite quickly um, my question that i had around this particular administrative procedure that you're bringing uh, to us this, this evening is i was wondering if either yourself or um, another staff member as appropriate can speak a little bit more to the hardship policy and what that looks like in practice for parents uh, who may not be able to afford the costs of supplies um, that is being asked of them. So three, Mr. Chair, I think, I mean, with respect to this policy, I would say that the hardship policy would apply, but perhaps I could ask Mr. Superintendent Saywell to talk about what that might look like in schools or Mr. Davey. If, and if I could clarify, I ask because uh, this particular administrative procedure does reference the hardship pol the hardship policy um, when speaking about school supplies. That's why I bring it up. Yeah, um, thank you through you, Chair. Uh, so you're just looking for um, uh, an example of when the hardship policy has been used, um, Trustee Barron? Yeah, so when this information is being provided to parents or if it's being provided to parents, what does that look like? How do parents find out that that is an option so that they yeah. are not feeling the stress of costs that they can't afford? So just seeking to understand a little bit more. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Uh, I fear it is not a well-known policy, frankly, uh, the hardship policy. And when, uh, you know, I think uh, generally speaking, when parents are unable to pay for a field trip or uh, resources, supplies of that nature. Um, it's usually the school that uh, reaches out to the parent because they know their situation. It's not typically the reverse where the parent says, I, you know, I can't afford it. Um, and so uh, maybe there's some work we have to do in that uh, we have to get that uh, uh, a little more well understood in uh, with parents around that we do have a hardship policy. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I will move on down the list and I see that we have, uh, I hope I pronounce your name correctly as well, Miss Gonigal. 
Hi, through the chair, I just thought I could provide a little bit of insight onto this. So um, at some schools, we do put it right out there to parents. If this cost is um, an issue for you, please contact your child's teacher or the principal. And our Nanaimo Ladysmith Schools Foundation is a terrific support for school supplies. So in the past, they used to bulk order and we would let them know how many of each thing we need. And now, if you purchase your supplies at your school, they will just pay the amount. So if we charged our kids $30 and a family couldn't pay, we can submit that amount to the Nanaimo Latest with Schools Foundation and they will reimburse the school. Um, as with regards to field trips, it's like Superintendent Saywell said, schools, we have a bit of a slush fund. We can apply to the um, Altrusa Club donates money to schools each year that you can uh, put towards field trips for students who can't um, afford it or we have our principal's account. Um, even my PAC has a, they call it a family funding part and they will help out with planners or uh, field trips or hot lunches as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we'll move on to Miss Cornthwaite. Thank you, Tara, well done. Um, I would uh, like to just make a comment about the name of this particular fund. And I would love to see this fund renamed from the Hardship Fund to something else, like maybe the Family Support Fund or um, something other than Hardship. Um, just the implications for families may be off-putting in terms of their access. And I think our renaming would um, be less um, be less of a stigma for families. Thank you. I was muted. My apologies. Thank you, uh, Miss Cornthwaite. Um, I'm next on the list. I have a question and a comment, um, probably for Mr. Walsh. Uh, so I was looking into this. Um, AP and I did a bit of research and I came across a section in the school act. I'm hoping you can help me understand a little bit better. Um, so I was going to ask is my question um, as it relates to this uh, AP is what is the intention behind section 82 of the school act which says the board must provide educational resource materials necessary to participate in the educational program free of charge? Sure, so uh, th th well through you to you Mr. Chair. Uh, so in the, the particular case uh, it, it speaks to uh, the if in fact it was originally I think brought into the legislation and applied in the, the concept. We're going to charge you a school athletics fee in order to be able to participate. We're going to charge you a band fee and able to participate, although there's still the ability to charge for rental fees for, for band. Uh, if the field trip is associated with the curriculum, then then we would um, then we would we could still charge, but we we couldn't prevent you from from participating um, if by virtue of that fee. And so with respect to supplies, 82 is not necessarily like if if we require like I think it, it should say uh, the definition does not um, OK, where is it? The school shall attempt to supply scissors, paints, brushes, paints, glues, workbooks, art supplies to all students, for instance. So if we're having an art class and it's uh, fundamental to, or it's part of the curriculum that they have to have an art book, for instance, I think that it's getting at that. Uh, textbook fees, you can have textbook deposits. Um, but as far as I'm aware, we wouldn't prevent a student from getting their educational program if they didn't bring a pencil to school, as in we would have a pencil available to us. But the proactive purchase of supplies in this manner is appropriate under the Act. But if we had it to that to the point of the the and and a nice point I think by Miss um, Cornthwaite about you know the name hardship. If we had someone that's on in unable to pay, we can't require it for the purpose of like we can't require them to pay for something if it's for the purpose of the educational program. That's much clearer. I now understand what they were trying to get at there. So thank you for that, Mr. Walsh. And if I may, um, just one comment. Um, 
I'm wondering, it, it, perhaps this is already our practice, um, but if it would make sense to have um, something in the AP that basically says that the board will publish the schedule of fees, um, charges and deposits before the beginning of the school year. So through you, Mr. Chair, we do we do are obligated to publish fees in the sense of our academy fees. I believe that must come to the board. I can't recall the meeting it came to, but it must come on a yearly basis, I believe, if it hasn't changed. Um, but can I confirm that you're speaking to the school supplies? Because the, the purpose of this AP is not to say there is a $50 fee. The purpose of this is to say, here's the school supply list that we anticipate for the year. We've got a way cheaper way and a way more convenient way to get all this stuff for you. Do you want to pool your money in, into it? Not you must pool your money. Here's an option for you. And so I'm not sure that that would necessarily be be published. And again, the reason that we didn't put a maximum of $40 or even $50 is maybe there is a program that is a little bit more or a classroom that's a little bit more. And that's why it did give some flexibility. OK, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, thanks for that clarification. I will move on to the next in the speakers list, uh, Trustee Berzovic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh, I wasn't going to mention this because I thought I was wordsmithing, but in re in listening to what you said about section 82, I'm one, I think it might actually could matter as I remember the lawsuit around this issue years and years ago. You use the word workbooks. I would suggest notebooks would be more appropriate, might be better because workbooks to me and to many people I know would imply like a textbook slash slash et cetera, et cetera. Where, whereas what I think you mean is like for when children write their math questions out and you know an exercise book. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I assume you are correct, uh, Trustee Berzovich. I just didn't change that line from the previous AP. It's the way it's currently drafted. Yeah, um, but happy, but, but happy to review that because I am I will take this away and make a couple of, of changes and show the board those changes. Great, thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. Thank you for this good work. And uh, I don't, oh, I see that Trustee McKay just popped up on the chat. Would you like to comment? No, she says, okay, thank you, Trustee McKay. Um, so I guess we're, looks like okay to move on to our second AP for this evening, which is AP 208. And go ahead, Mr. Thank Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it might just be for time's sake. Uh, I'll maybe deal with all three of the next APs at the same time. So 208 uh, and 209, uh, all that's happened with respect to these APs, uh, and these are the APs that guide our processes with respect to FIPA, uh, the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy. And so one of them is essentially telling the community who is responsible for what, and it's just updating it to include the executive director of communications, privacy and engagement, just to just to make it clear who it is, as well as on page 41. Uh, it's also added uh, the idea that we do do privacy impact assessments and we do keep them on hand for the public to be able to inspect if they do so wish. And it's important that we make that, I think, clear because it really shows our privacy. Uh, uh, we take their privacy obligations seriously. With respect to AP 209, it's just modernizing what we charge and how we charge for a variety of, um, of how people get information. And so if you look over the previous AP, literally we're talking about floppy disks. And so we have no intention of giving any information on a floppy disk uh, to anyone unless you want it from 1991. <laughs> and so we're just, it's just modernizing really that because really the, the idea of FIPA is the idea that we're supposed to give it in the most convenient way, information in the most convenient way. And so why have these things that don't make any sense? And it looks like, makes us look like we haven't reviewed it in the 25 years <laughs> since we didn't, since we actually drafted it. So those are those changes. 
The last one is AP335, and I want to be clear that the change that you see tonight is not, we did not review the 335 to bring it up to modern standard. We didn't go out to uh, our, you know, our ed tech committee and say, hey, what are the great changes that we should make? That still needs to happen. What the change you see on page 46 of the agenda is just that when we were reviewing these, we noted that there was a, a paragraph in the AP that goes beyond the requirements of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and we weren't actually necessarily uh, adhering to our own AP in this regard. And what it specifically did, and I think unknowingly, is it created an obligation on the board to not publish any of our employee names on a school website without specific consent. So what I mean is, is if you're the teacher or the EA or the, the secretary, maybe they, they applied, but or they did in the previous one. It wasn't clear though. And in every school, you go to the website and you would expect to find your teacher and their email, their teacher and their phone number. And technically that wasn't allowed under the previous AP or the AP as drafted until today. And so the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and I'm sorry to bore everyone in the meeting, <laughs> specifically says that your business contact information is not personal information. So it's not protected in that sense. And so we've been, we went to labor management with both the NDTA and QP. We incorporated one of the changes suggest, suggested by the NDTA, and it's just to reflect what we currently do. That's not to say that we don't go back and have more of a review and more changes in future, but we just don't want to be running afoul of our own APs and this update fixes that. Great, thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh, and I missed the days of the 1.4 megabyte floppy disk for sure. Thank you. The little one or the big one? You know, the the little apple uh, okay. anyways off topic here thank you very much um, are there any comments or questions for secretary walsh uh, regarding these ap's okay great uh seeing nobody uh jumping to the queue here in the chat uh we can move on to item 8.4 this is the ombuds person complaint handling guide there's an information sheet on page 47 of your agenda Go ahead, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So here um, is we've received, I think trustees might have received it as well, a complaint handling guide from the ombudsperson. And so the ombudsperson's office is the office where people particularly that have issues with procedural um, uh, concerns with, with public bodies. Uh, for instance, I like to complain about something, uh, you know, the district is not following its administrative procedure about this. Uh, where they bring concerns forward. And so what the complaint handling guide did is, is it, I took their experiences of where the hiccups are with respect to processes uh, and provide some, some feedback. We've taken that guide and reviewed our processes and we're actually quite satisfied um, with, with AP325, uh, with 424 and bylaw 4.1. So what we've come is with a small uh, addition to AP325, and that's just to specifically make sure that individuals are aware that after the board has heard an appeal, assuming that the appeal is denied, that we're gonna proactively within the body of our own uh, AP tell, um, tell people that they do have an avenue to go to the next step, which is a superintendent of appeal. So we've made that one addition. Uh, and then you'll see with respect to the bylaw, um, we don't believe it needs uh, uh, to a motion. You'll see just a very minor uh, procedural uh, or word shift because we do not have procedure 3560P. It is now administrative procedure 325. So we've adjusted that. The one other thing though, and ha happy to answer any questions generally, we do believe um, perhaps when time, uh, when we, in a few months after the budget, we actually may suggest that, that our processes go to perhaps the policy committee 
or be sent out particularly to DPAC to see if they have any changes that they would like to see. Um, there's two that stand out to us and we as staff didn't want to come and recommend anything major tonight. Uh, one though is AP 424. We actually don't know why we have it um, because really AP 325 should cover that and if it doesn't cover it we think that it can be incorporated into it however again we want to talk to DPAC and we want trustees and our community to have a chance to think about that and then the other one is is that there are a few things a few um, pieces that we think that the board may want to consider with respect to its appeal process and so specifically the board's appeal process uh, ironically is wider than what can be appealed to the superintendent of appeal. So for instance, and maybe the board wants to keep it that way, that's fine, and, and it, but we think it's worth thinking about. So for instance, the superintendent of appeal has in the, in the regulations uh, issued by the Ministry of Education, specifically says that a resourcing decision um, related to a student can't be appealed to the superintendent of appeal, but our own appeal processes don't necessarily mirror that limitation. So those are a couple of the things that we want to come back with. But again, for the purposes of tonight, we wanted just to say that we've reviewed the complaint handling guide uh, and have made one minor change to the AP, which is there, and just talk about what those next steps we think look like. Yes, thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. I see that Trustee McKay would like to comment. Thank you. So I guess I just would like to acknowledge um, the work that that has gone into the review um, of the complaint handling guide. When it first came in, it was interesting to start to look at two different documents and and in passing that off and asking to see if we were meeting the guidelines of uh, provincially what those guidelines might look like for complaint handling process. Um, I'm pleased to see that you've come back and said that uh, generally what we're doing works um, and meets those provincial guidelines. I think that's important for transparency for the board um, and I look forward to the further discussions that we'll have around um, whether or not we need further discussion or changes to these APs um, based on board values. Uh, but I did just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, the work that's come before us and, and the work that you've undertaken to, to complete this review is appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee McKay. Uh, next on our speakers list is Trustee Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, so thank you. I, I have to admit, um, if I can get some clarity, um, so through the chair to Secretary Treasurer uh, Walsh, did you say that the uh, APs specifically, and I'm trying to pull up my on my screen that the agenda, and it's not working, um, that we're not going, we're going to be reviewing those later. So the one that I was actually wanting to comment on was AP325. Um, so did you say that that that's going to be a conversation for a later point in time? So through you, Mr. Chair. So the purpose of our review is to make sure that we weren't running afoul of any of the principles that are in the complaint guide, just to make sure that we aligned. And so again, we're saying that we we recommend that we're satisfied or we're satisfied with the minor change that we still align. However, that doesn't prevent us from doing a, a broader review. However, again, I think that's given the importance of this to the public. It's it would kind of be some kind of process to review that document, but we we don't have any suggestions that need to change to meet the complaint handling guide. But yes, we would recommend that it may be well time to get some comments about AP uh, 325 as well as 4.1. So if I may follow up, Chair? Yes, please, go ahead. I, I just, you know what, I'm, I'm only commenting, I respect that we're having this conversation later. I'm gonna make a comment because I think it's timely, maybe. Um, when I read this, um, the suspension piece, let me pull it up. Um, 
under the reasons that could be considered to be deemed sufficiently affect the education, health, or safety of a student under the purpose section. And then it goes to disciplinary suspension from a school for a period in excess of 10 consecutive days. Um, the only reason I want to bring that up now is just in a quarterly system that we are doing under COVID protocols. That is a massive amount of time. So I just want to highlight, um, express concern in the current crisis context that we are in. We may want to function differently for this period of time, given that 10 days is two weeks, which is what, one quarter of a quarter? So that could have dramatic influence. So I, I just, yeah, I, I don't expect a conversation about this moment in time, but I was just very struck by, by that um, given COVID. Thank you, Trustee Bear, uh, Stanley. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anybody else on the speakers list. So uh, thank you again for all your work on the AP's uh, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. We really do appreciate that. Um, moving on to item 8.5, uh, Forest Park Elementary School Rights of Way Bylaw 2021. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and actually just to express a bit of appreciation for uh, you raised a few questions earlier about is this the final document? Is this what it looks like? And and uh, appreciate it. So essentially I introduce it and um, Mr. Sabo is going to join me here is that what we're looking at is a right of way uh, by a request by Nanaimo at Forest Park but what you're not seeing here is the final document as of yet. And the reason for that is, is that it's just not ready. And we wanted to make sure that the board had the opportunity to discuss, ask questions about the general issue, that, that being the easement. Um, and so what we would, what we'll have, essentially what they're looking for at this point while the final document is done, is that yes, the board in principle is would agree to a, a statutory right of way in this regard. And so the um, the bylaw would will have the final documents associated with it at the board meeting. And but the idea again to be able to ask questions that we would enter into an agreement to agree really with Nanaimo and then we would uh, we would then file the proper documents that are going to be prepared by them, but we will obviously review for a right of way. It's a regular occurrence that, that we have. Um, and another good question that was asked was, a right of way is a disposition of land. And yes, it's a disposition of land, but for the purposes of uh, public consultation and for the purposes of the School Act, it's considered a disposition of an interest and doesn't require the same onerous uh, consultation requirements that uh, you know the sale or long-term lease of land would would require. So maybe I could ask uh, Mr. Sabo to to just talk about where it is and how it impacts or doesn't impact our site briefly. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Sabo. Thank you. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. A bit of a delay in my computer. I'm muting and unmuting myself as it uh, goes on, but uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, on page 62 of your agenda package is an aerial view of Forest Park site. And there's a red line in the middle of the page and that orients you as to where the actual easement is uh, on the school on the school site. On the following page, um, 63 on the landscape, you can see that it's a it's zoomed in on that area. And the city of the Nimos have recently approached us. They're doing a water main upgrade in the neighborhood, and they've approached us to run a section of water line through our property in order to achieve the velocities they require in the in the event of fire flows. And so connecting a link through our property will allow the 
um, velocities to be reduced in the water lines and therefore protect the integrity of the of the city's water network. Now the area in question is an underutilized area. It's a bit of playground. It's along a property line. It's it's inside a setback, meaning we can't build into that area and there are no surface features. There's one subsurface uh, infrastructure, which is a catch basin and the city is going to relocate that out of the way. Um, they would like to do the work at spring break. And so following up uh, Secretary Treasurer's comments, um, they provided us with this information. There's a uh, and uh, we will be after the approval of the bylaw, we will be in a position to grant them access to the site so that they can perform the work. Once the work's done, they will confirm the actual size of the easement required based on the location of the work. And they do that just in case uh, they find something and they have to reroute the pipe and then uh, they don't have to redo the easement again. So they'll call a surveyor in after the pipe is installed and they'll finalize the uh, they'll finalize the easement area. Um, they'll reinstate it and um, and put it back into normal for school operation when they return from spring break. Uh, thank you all pause for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sabo and Mr. Walsh. I don't see any questions uh, in the chat and I see that trustee Berzovic would like to move the motion. Thank you. That the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District number 68, the Nanaimo Ladysmith, give all free readings of the bylaw cited as Forest Park Elementary School right-of-way bylaw 2021 during the February 24th 2021 open board meeting and that the business committee recommends that the Board of Education of School District 68 and I'm a Ladysmith adopt the bylaw cited, cited as Forest Park Elementary School right-of-way bylaw 2021 during the February 24th 2021 open board meeting. Do I have a seconder? Uh, seconded by Trustee McKay. Any, uh, sorry, Trustee Berzovic, would you like to motivate the motion? No, I mean, I think that it's, no, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Thank you, Trustee Berzovic. Uh, okay, so our seeing no comments or discussion, I will call the question. Uh, is there anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item nine, uh, correspondence from the regular board meeting. We have none. Uh, item 10, no unfinished business. Uh, item 11, no new business. Item 12, we do have one item, 12.1, a uh, budget calendar. So this is just uh, to let you know that uh, we, there is a budget calendar attached to the agenda on page 73. Uh, Mr. Walsh, did you want to provide any information related to this? Sure, just maybe I'll add briefly, thank you, Mr. Chair, is that uh, I do want to just put the offer out uh, and the finance team is always excited to, to chat. Um, that if anyone does want, uh, you know, if if DPAC, if our partners uh, want another opportunity to do some kind of general budget literacy sessions, or or would that if that would be useful, even outside of this process, um, we're always happy to make some time. We want to make sure that everyone uh, is feeling an understanding of of how it's getting created, and particularly given the the fact that. I think we are we are looking at trying to budget from a conservative perspective. We want everyone to really understand uh, all the inputs and all the decision points um, that are going to be here till uh, till the the final passage. Hopefully, there uh, as you see in the calendar. So just kind of open open offer there. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Walsh. I appreciate seeing the uh, the calendar and knowing the steps that were going to be taking so thank you for that okay so moving on uh, we do not have uh, any questions this evening and our last item 14 adjournment can I have a motion to adjourn moved by trustee McKay and do we need a seconder seconded by trustee Barron uh, I'm sure no one's opposed but I'll ask the question anyone opposed Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.